Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to some more Let's Play The Occult Chronicles. Everyone, it is September 3rd today, 2019, and thus it is the, or will be entering into the fall months. And you guys know by now, during the fall months, or maybe you don't know by now, I like playing a thematic, creepy, or Halloweenish themed type games for my channel. And the Occult Chronicle fits that bill. So we're going to be playing some more Occult Chronicles for my channel, everyone. This is probably the last year I will be recording the Occult Chronicles. The computer that I've been using to run this game is beginning to give up the ghost. Thematic, I suppose, for, uh, for the Halloween months. However, it's also the last game that I can use Fraps to record cryptic comic video games. So, as such... I hope you guys like what we're about to do, because this will probably be the last year we record it. Now, before we go any further, you guys should know that there'll be a link, two links down below. One of them will jump you to where I do a good amount of explanation about what the Occult Chronicles is like, just in case you've never heard or seen this game before. The other link will jump you further into this video, or on BitChute, it'll just tell you what time you should advance the slider to where we actually start the adventure in case you don't want to hear me talk a little bit about the Occult Chronicles. It should hopefully take like maybe five minutes and we'll go ahead and make a character as well. Before we go any further, if you like what you see here, you should know some things about the Occult Chronicles before you run off to purchase it. Number one, the Occult Chronicles, for, I consider it a guilty pleasure of mine. While I like the game, it is one of the few games that I play on my channel that I cannot recommend you pick up. The game has, I'm, I'm just going to say, quite a few balance issues with it. Uh, <laughs> spelling errors, it can occasionally glitch and lock and kick you back to desktop. And it's a bit clunky, um, GUI-wise as well. There's a lot you'll need to learn about it. The game's mechanics, especially combat or challenges, is also pretty repetitious and does not allow you to really do too much deviation with how it's played until the later parts of the game. Finally, the game features a balancer, is what I call it. The better you do, the higher your stats, the tougher the game makes it for you to win. Yeah, I don't like this idea in the game. Imagine Darkest Dungeon where if you found a good piece of loot, suddenly all the creatures would do an extra 50% damage. So it's, it can be rather unfair. So and what you're about to watch as well, I have modded. I spent some amount of time uh, adding new discussions and dialogue options or choices for dealing with certain encounters, especially for magic, because the game, I think, was probably rushed to completion at the very end. During my attempting of modding the game, I discovered a bunch of other magic options which were disabled. They were present in the game files, but they weren't linked in, and I just relinked them in and then tweaked their numbers. Other options I made whole cloth from nothing when I began figuring out how to mod this game. I haven't touched the mod of this game though since the last time we played it, so just about a year ago was the last time I did any modding for it. Right. So I think that about covers the basics, everyone. I'm going to quickly check to see how my voice is coming out because I have not recorded on the old computer now since we last played Cryptarch. I think that was back in the beginning of the summer, before the summer. I haven't been in this room for four months either. So uh, I'll be right back, everyone. Give me a few seconds. All right, everyone. Sounds like my voice is coming out okay. I've moved my microphone a little closer to me. I've forgotten how different the acoustics are in the room I'm currently recording this in. Let's go ahead and start us up a new game and create ourselves a character to adventure within this horrible mansion and defeat whatever evils we decide we want to throw ourselves against today. And I like starting this out with the Elder because it's Halloween or it's, it's the fall months. I think in Halloweenish terms and I like kind of Halloweenish themed games around this time and it's vampires this is this is perfect so we'll fight against the elder 
Despite the loss of two entire tactical operation teams, Operation Driven Stake has been a major success. The vampire clans have been smashed, two elders have been destroyed, and those remaining have been driven into hiding. Mop-up operations continue apace, and recent intelligence indicates that some minor Nosferatu elements might have taken refuge in the abandoned Corivrius Manor. Your assignment is to visit the manor and determine the nature and extent of any vampire clan activity that is ongoing there. You should begin your sur survey in the morning and plan to finish before dusk to ensure your safety. Over here, we have the various difficulty options, including difficulty itself, that we want to select during the game. Story speed, if you can, you can select either anywhere from fast or turning it off. Turning it off means you can take as long as you like to beat the game. The only thing you'll have to worry about is if your character actually perishes. I like playing with a slow story speed. In this way, our game is timed. If we cannot beat the game before the story, the last story token is drawn, we have lost. In this case, that sun will slowly set. The difficulty, I tend to enjoy playing on Agent. Anything higher, I feel, is a is a real like you ha you have to you have to really like suffering if you want to play on anything higher than agent. So agent's perfect for me. Playing an agent, I would consider agent to be the normal difficulty level. And we will play on Reaper. Reaper is basically roguelike mode. Our character dies. That is it. Game over. You cannot save the game other than when you quit the game as well. All right. Next, let's go ahead and make ourselves a character. Remember everyone that down in that comment section, there will be a link to where I cover a lot of this in depth. I will only give the barest synopsis here because I want to get into the game. First, we need a name for a character. And I've been watching a little bit of the, um, what is it? King of Fighters tournaments recently. So we're going to make a Terry Bogard today. Of course, he's not wearing the red cap. He's a bit older, but whatever. We're going to play him. Next, for a background, I think a boxer would make sense for Terry. You like to hit things when you want to solve a problem. You know that you could have been a contender if it hadn't been for that lucky shot from Max Schemling that brought your undefeated streak to an end. After that, the thrill was gone. The yod lets you bump back hard against things that go bump in the night. The boxer is one of the weaker backgrounds. Not as bad as circus performer, but not as strong as some of the others. We'll start with the Bona Cups, which is good because that gives us something to use when it comes to um, heroic feats. We gain one Physical Test and Climbing Edge. That's an interesting edge to get. We get a heroic, one Heroic Defensive Feat. We start with a random Defense Edge. A Water Talisman, D4 Starting Life, which is pretty bad. And one uh, plus one Cups, which is okay that to us. For a bone, I don't think I'm probably going to select a background which requires wands. So, with that in mind, or, or, we could take a bone of pentacles so that spells could be cast earlier. We could also take swords so we could use some weapon abilities quicker, and thus save a little bit of experience points later on. But I generally like picking a bone that I know I will not acquire during the game. So we'll make that wands this time around. For our starting edge... Hmm... Let's go with... Preternatural Senses. Oh, you know... Terry Bogard doesn't have pre-natural senses, Tim. He might be good at dodging, or lightning reflexes would actually make sense for him, though. Some of these other ones for combat sound like they would be good, but we're not starting with the melee weapon, and we may never find one. So... And furthermore, um, we'd have to hope the weapon is one that makes sense with the ability. If our combat ability is one that bumps down a card, having a edge which bumps up, this isn't going to help us whatsoever. So I don't think we want any of those. Oh, we could take like a, a, a 
We could take an edge that help us, helps us run away. The Boxer is basically a Cups character, which is much more difficult to play than other types of characters tend to be. But I think, nah, I think we'll stick with, with one of these. Let's go for Lightning Reflexes. It'll make traps a little easier for us to do. Over here for our skills, you know by now I like, or maybe you don't know by now because it's been a, over a, almost a year since I last played the game. I like building balanced characters. If you unbalance your character, which is to say, let's say we go with like four swords and one and everything else. This character is going to struggle because the game's going to see four swords and say, You're really strong. Let's make this tougher for you. And so I don't like that. We'll put at least two in everything. And our last point will go into wands. Really quick, in case you forgot, swords is used basically for physical challenges. It's your ability to basically strike things with your fists or weapons. Cups, it represents your strength and agility. It's going to be your... Um, these two tend to work in tandem with each other when doing certain challenges. Swords is for beating things up. Cups is for running away. Cups has a secondary effect that helps you beat things up. Swords helps you run away. Wands is for psychic abilities, which we're not going to have much of. But I also don't plan on raising this again during the game. Pentacles is used for spells. You need good wands and pentacles for most of the quests. Probably at least two points in each to get those quests. Some later quests might require you having three or even four in a stat in order to get them. These two also are used for horror checks and thus, um, well, I want three in wands because I never, I don't plan to take a background later on that will let me increase it. Pentacles though, we will probably take something that lets us cast spells later. As for health and sanity, we'll start with Two points in Sanity and one point in Health. Since we're starting with D4 extra Health points, I want more in Sanity to start. Alright! That's it. Let's go, Terry. Okay. Let's get in there and start the running away. <laughs> I like to say beating things up as a boxer, but Cups isn't, doesn't let you play that way. Remember again, everyone, that I have modded this game. I will point out the differences to you where I remember them as we encounter them. Love the music to this game. I have the soundtrack to this, by the way, uploaded to my channel. In case you guys were uh, were curious, I think I think I might have mentioned it earlier. This will probably be the last year I record Occult Chronicles. This computer is beginning to give up the ghost. I've had him for six years now, and uh, or had her for six years, and uh, it's probably time to look into getting a new one. Did I pick Boxer? I did. Okay. Oh, I okay. I understand what's happening. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm looking. At, okay. <laughs> right. Let's start, everyone. Let's start. Hello. Welcome to Occult Chronicles. I'm being really uh, confusing and mysterious at the moment. I looked down here and did not see any numbers. And I was like, didn't we get a heroic feat? And we did. But I know we have an edge, which is reducing the weight of a, at least one heroic feat by one pound. Well, we will cover that later. Right, so, here we are with Terry Borgard. We're starting at the entrance of the mansion. We are here to see if the vampires are here, and if so, bring down the coven. We started with an extra cups. We, we went from two to three because our starting background gave us that. We're starting with the ship as a talisman. So remember that talismans are used when you fail a challenge. There's a chance it will show up, a 45% chance in this case. And if we select the card that's under it, because you have to pick penalties upon failing a challenge, you will ignore whatever the effect was under that card. However, selecting that card means that there will be a 4% chance that this talisman will be gone and you will lose it forever. This is also a cups talisman which means it is used in cups challenges that tends to be traps and running away 
Here are our edges. We have one point in lightning reflexes out of four. One in four for hidden talents. X is subtracted from the total incumbrance points of any heroic feat cards in your cup's inventory for the purpose of determining how many incumbrance points worth of cards you can have in your cup's inventory, where X is the level of the edge. What does that mean? You see this one right here? This means that instead of having a limit of three weight, I'm, I'm sorry, this is saying that we subtract one total weight from all of these cards we have in our cups inventory. We have one, so that's minus one. If we pick up another feat later on in the game, then you will start to see this number increase. Some feats are worth two points, others are worth one point. And what does this do? Duck and roll. Roll one bone, and then sub select X revealed non-face trick cards and bump their values down minus X, where X is the number of cups rolled. Then draw a card. So this will let us more easily win some of the challenges. If those challenges do not involve a face card. And we have Fitness Fanatic. X additional unrevealed tricks are placed on the board at the start of any physical test, where X is the level of the edge. There's our bones, and that's it. All right, everyone, let's get started. Let's, uh, let's go out to the right to start this time. Or, or not. There we go. We should check to see if there's a secret passage up here. There isn't. Orange spots are spots where we have walked. Gray are spots that we you have not. You generally want to try to investigate all the spots, which is to say step on them, because there's a chance you could get a clue. There are, I think, eight clue tokens for every mission in the game, and you'll want to find as many of them as possible to give you the best chance of beating the final boss, who is waiting for you at the second level of the basement somewhere. This question mark symbol here means that there is an event of some sort waiting for us here. We don't know what it is. We have to walk into that spot to find out. Pile of junk. You notice a small pile of junk cluttering up a section of the floor. Upon closer examination, you see an assortment of typical cast-off items, broken pieces of this and that. So this is one of the rare encounters you can have which does not involve some sort of horrible ghost or monster that you have to pass a horror check for. You only get one chance to search this, and with that, with those numbers, I don't want to search it quite yet. We'll come back for this. You can get like a sledgehammer or an axe from this. You might be able to get a first aid kit or a map or a journal, maybe a gun, some experience points, sanity or life. In any case, I don't want to fail this challenge. So we're gonna wait until we get more pentacles before we come back to this. Strategically interacting with these encounters is a big part of the game. You want to make sure that you beat up things you can beat up, run away from things that you can't until you can, until you can get lucky and get leveled up. Hello. Mm, I see toys in the center here and what looks like ghosts as well. This is a children's play area. We should probably investigate. A nursery, yep. You can see in the upper left-hand corner what type of room this is as we walk into it. A clue. Minus one target level. You smell iron in the air. It smells like blood. Then you hear a long howl, like a wolf, from somewhere nearby. Alright, there probably are vampires around. The Demon Baby. You are startled by the rocking cradle. It seems to be moving by its own accord. The squeaking of the runners on the wood is unsettling. You step closer. As you approach, you begin to suspect there is something lying inside the cradle. You peer down into it and behold a thing of astounding ugliness. A demon baby. It grins at you, and you are afraid. 
Your eyes wide in disbelief as the demon baby coos at you in some kind of demonic cant. It gnaws at your sanity. The first time you encounter, well, an encounter, you will have to pass a horror check. If you fail, you will have a chance to lose sanity. If you succeed, you have a chance to gain sanity. The way the game works is you draw a, well, based on the numbers you saw on the previous screen, I'll go into it next time we have an encounter, you get, you have the target level, which is the number of points you must earn, a number of trick cards are placed onto the board face down, you don't know what they are, and up to 10 trick cards total are allowed to be on the board at any one time. You then draw cards into your hand after you put the trick cards out on the board, I believe, and this makes up your hand to beat the tricks. You spend turns turning over a card. If you have a matching card, of which matches a suit of this card, you must play that card, or a card of the same suit that matches. In this case, is a nine of wands, and we must play our four of wands. We are not allowed to turn over any other cards until we have done so. Because our card is a lower value than this card, we get nothing for it. Here, our nine took that four. A number card is worth one point when taken and or used. So in this case, that has earned us two points. Pages are worth two. A jack is worth th three. A queen is worth four. And the king is worth five. Your mind is weak. You begin to sob and weep in terror. Come on, Terry, it was a baby. It was a baby. Its cooing is almost as disturbing as its demonic appearance. You've heard of an odd agent who might have once looked like this. However, this thing radiates pure, radiates pure evil. It's not going to jump at a recruitment offer, and most certainly has something in mind other than lying here waiting for its mother. Most question mark encounters in the mansion's first and second floor are related to a quest of some sort. Most, not all. Some of them in the attic are related to a quest as well. There might be, I think, two or three in basement level one, and there are none in basement level two. Keep this in mind if you decide to pick up this game, I, and again, um, I'm just going to say it, I, I, I don't recommend you pick up this game unless you really, really like suffering. I don't, I don't know if that's a good, well, let's, let's move on. So, um, rest, just mentioning that as, as a tip. Alright, so, because also this is a quest encounter, the game has made the difficulty extremely high for us to actually destroy this creature. I have thought about actually lowering how difficult it is to defeat these things in combat in case you don't want to actually get the quest for it. Um, right, what am I trying to say? This is the second part of a quest. The game will let us actually fight this creature and remove it from the board if we win, in which case we can't even get the first part of the quest, if I recall correctly. However, because it is the second part of a quest, the game has given us a really high difficulty level. You can see that in order to beat it up, we need a 10 target points, and we're only drawing three tricks and four draw onto the board. It's not going to work, so we have to get very lucky. We will just leave this alone. You decide not to rock the cradle and leave well enough alone. Class 1 Haunting. Suddenly you see the dim glow of a formless ghost just ahead of you. It seems to just hang in the air. Now we didn't see a question mark here when we encountered this. This is a random monster. There are, I want to say, six or seven different types of normal random monsters you will encounter no matter what type of mission you decided to select. And this is one of them. There's also, I think, anywhere from one to three different type of specific encounters you can get based on the mission you selected. In our case, I think we find uh, 
watchers is what they're called, little hunchbacks with uh, shovels or picks who are working for the vampires. In any case, uh, this is the first time we are seeing this random encounter, so we must pass a horror check. It may be the most basic of spectral creatures, an unformed psychokinetic disturbance, but it's a spirit all the same, and it would frighten any flesh and blood human. We can take the chance that there will be another Cups card here and hold on to the page and hope that Cups card is a 10 or less. Or we could use the page to get very close to winning this challenge. We'll take a risk and hold on to our page and get two points instead of three. Bad choice. You stand paralyzed with fear. You hope you don't get slimed. Because we failed the challenge, we are forced to take two cards from these. We lost a sanity point. The haunting manifests itself as a dim ball of light. It has no sense of its previous life or existence. It wanders, hopelessly lost. You should exercise caution. These haunts cannot be reasoned with and they can be lethal with disturbed. Normally, this is the only option you have. Destroy the ghost. I'm oh, sorry, you can destroy the ghost or flee it. I have added this one to this encounter. Um, Cryptic Comic made it so that like ghosts can only be defeated if you're psychic in nature. But this means if you're playing a physical character like I want to, this means that you'll never be able to defeat these creatures and you need to run. And the tougher that uh, the, mo the more leveled you get, the tougher these creatures become until even running from them is something almost impossible for you to do. So I have given you an option, or I've given you an option. I have made it so that I have an option to actually use my physical traits instead. And we'll try it. Get her. That's it. That's the whole plan. Get her. Oh, you have a King of Swords. That's nice. Assuming we have a, are lucky enough to have a Swords up here somewhere. And we do. The king is worth five points. The ten is worth one point. That earns us six total. Eight. Always Now, we could win right now, but always try... Always try to get as many points as, as possible. Because if you're going to fail, the less you fail by is means that you draw less penalty cards. For victories, this means that you draw more victory cards. You got her good. No one's going to believe how you did it, and you're not sure you are either. Since we won, and this was against a ghost, I think I made it so that you have a chance to recover sanity, and you get some experience points. Most of the cards will be nothing of interest. Grand dining room and something. I think this is a billiards room. Let's explore the dining room. I think there's a quest here which will let us interact with the demon baby. The ghostly dinner party. I, I still love this picture. One of my favorite pictures for the game. It seemed impossible at first, but slowly you recognize the sounds of clinking glasses and the soft murmur of conversation. A long dining table stands in front of you, surrounded on all ends by dusty chairs. As you come nearer, you think you detect some movement around the table, and the hairs on your arms begin to stand on end. It's suddenly very cold. A ghostly face peers out from behind one of the chairs, and in a heartbeat, you see the apparition seated all around the table. The scene twists at the very threads of your sanity. You struggle to comprehend this brush with the supernatural. You have rarely seen this many ghosts congregated together before. You've kept your sanity. You hardly feel at ease, but your willpower is rock steady. You're confronted with a very unusual scene. You stand before a dinner party of ghosts, 
who for the most part seem completely oblivious to your presence. Occasionally, you see a ghost looking around as if trying to find a servant. However, most seem fully preoccupied with ghostly gossip and dinner chatter. Well, we can attempt to fight them, or we can try to get the quest that they have. I kind of feel like these options should say quest on them, just to heavily hint that, hey, you get a quest by succeeding here. Let's actually, let's actually try to interrupt them. You decide to use your powers as a medium to tap your ectoplasmic knife against the glass and grab their attention. Maybe a direct approach will let you start a conversation so that you can gather some information. Of course, there are some risks involved with this approach. Now, we'll just win this challenge. I wouldn't mind having a starting quest. Rows of ghostly heads turn towards you and gaze expectantly. You offer a pithy toast and they seem pleased. Before you know it, you are gabbing away. The general consensus is that the lack of a proper dessert is spoiling the festivities. You hear raucous cries for dessert, and many of the ghostly guests are looking expectantly towards you. Would you be so good as to find a butler and order our dessert? You haven't got the appetite for this right now. Love it. Love it. Love the puns. There is no quest to put that demon baby here. I'm always a little nervous walking into a room that has an encounter guarding it, but we'll take this chance. A row of talking busts. You notice a row of sculpted marble busts against the wall. You count four until you notice that one has fallen to the floor and subsequently cracked in half. A sudden chill comes over you as you watch in amazement as the faces on the busts begin to move. Lips pucker and cheeks flex as if they were warming up for something. And then they begin to sing. You hold your hands to your ears but the ghostly singing will not cease. Some jingle about grim grinning ghosts flows from their lips and you just wish the noise would stop. It might drive you crazy if it doesn't. Oh, that's a decent hand. We've got three face cards. Ah, should have played the knight. Your mind is strong. You start grinning right back at them and it seems to annoy them greatly. I also wish the game would flip over all the cards to see, to show you what you did not find. Just to give you an idea of what you can gain or not gain by doing these challenges. <coughs> Alas, we'll never know. <coughs> the, <coughs> the course of Talking Heads continues unabated even though it has no further effect on you. The heads seem to be having too good of a time to stop. You are certain that some sorceress cursed has bound spirits to these busts as some form of punishment. Just who is being punished, though, is an open question. We can interrupt them to get a quest, or we can try to destroy the busts. I think we'll try to get a quest from them. You decide to use your expertise as a medium to attract the bust's attention, and see if you can find out what their story is. They might have useful information, since they seem to have been sitting here for quite some time. I'll risk a failure once. You enter a trance and try interrupting them. You raise your voice. You ask politely. They are too caught up in their singing to even notice you. Trying to strategically fail a challenge is also something you want to consider doing. The better you do, the more cards you get. And the more cards you get to draw from, the better chance you have of getting some experience points. Every time you fail, it also becomes a little easier, either through either the target levels might drop, you might get an extra trick, or you might get an extra draw card the next time. I still don't like our hand. Let's just fail. That is a lot better. Two kings and a queen. Of course, we'll need the appropriate uh, suits up here. I was lucky. 13 points. You enter a trance and start singing along with them. It's painful, but by messing up the words and being dreadfully out of tune, you get their attention. Soon they are begging you to stop. That's when you take control of the conversation. Oh, 
Oh, we didn't get anything. The Busts were once members of a family that resided here. The story is muddled and conflicting from the various heads, and you are sure they are lying about what happened to some extent, but the short of it is that they were cursed by a Black Lodge sorcerer. They are unanimous in their opinion, though, that you can help them. The sorcerer also cursed a statue of a gargoyle. It resides somewhere in the house and contains a coin inside that, when used properly, can break the curse. Might as well go around the room. The Broken Circle. Your eyes are immediately drawn to the dancing flames. They seem to have no source of fuel, but are confined to a chalk circle enclosing a pentagram. At each point, a small votive candle still burns. Then you notice the robed body sprawled on the wooden floor. You step closer. As you advance step by step, you begin to feel uneasy. You sense a powerful evil presence in the room and a chill runs down your spine. A face takes form in the flames and you stop in your tracks. It seems to stare into your soul and you are afraid. This thing bound within the pentagram is demonic. Of that there is, can be no doubt. You must focus your mind and overcome the swelling sense of panic that the creature's gaze has sent through your entire being. You've kept your sanity and you break eye contact with the flaming demon. You'll know better than to look it directly in the eyes again. You have stumbled upon the scene of a demonic summoning gone wrong. I'm recording, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm not muted. I'm not muted. The power within the pentagram circle has obviously lashed out at its would-be master and killed him outright. What the hell was he doing here? Yeah, what the hell indeed. Communicating with it, apparently. Avoiding contact with the demon's fiery eyes, you examine the scene more closely. You notice that the chalk circle has been broken ever so slightly. This must be what led to the demise of the robed figure lying prostrate before you. Who knows what this poor evil soul had in mind? That would compel him to consort with demons. You must tread carefully here. We can get a quest from him, but it will be tricky. We could also complete the circle in order to banish the demon. I think we'll try bargaining with it. Or we could come back later. But we're here now. With the chalk circle broken, you wonder why the demon has not attacked you. Perhaps you could try and communicate with it and see what it wants. It's a choice that you should be considered carefully. You know from your training that the demon will seek to deceive and dominate you. I'm not going to mess around with the demon. I immediately want to win the challenge if it's possible. That was very lucky. We were able to use all of our nice large cards and end up with a ton of points. Initiating the communication via the lost sang language of Childash, you establish contact with the demon. It claims to be a prince of hell, but you suspect it exaggerates. It wants you to do something for it, and it promises to reward you if you hold to the bargain. A morphine ample. We'll take a look at that soon. Three life. Two more life. The demon wants your help and threatens to kill you and take your soul just as it did this sorry acolyte lying at your feet if you do not cooperate. In this house, a worthless servant has been trapped in a ritual of summoning. It was bound by the acolyte to a fireplace as a crude joke. On its mantelpiece is an old slip of paper with writing on it. Bring the paper back here so that he can release his servant and punish him. If you do this, he promises a reward fitting your task. So we got a morphine ampule, and that went into our cups inventory. Adds three points to your health stat. And for each the next co five combats, each generated wound card has a 50% chance of having a minus one modifier applied to it. All right, if we take a bunch of wounds, I have to remember I have that. We already passed a horror check against the heads, so we can just leave it alone. We haven't studied any traps yet, which is a bit odd. Second floor. Let's step upstairs really quick. Though I'm not staying here. I'm doing this just to get a little bit of this area marked on our map. So I know where a, a way down is, should I need it. The second floor has more difficult encounters on it than the first floor. And random monsters you encounter up on the second floor will be slightly more tougher than ones on the first floor. The difficulty, as far as I can recall, is 
goes from weakest to strongest in this order. First floor, second floor, outdoors, attic, basement level one, basement level two, basement level three. Hello. Reading room. An apparition of death. You see a chessboard set up for the commencement of a game. Upon closer examination, you discover that the pieces are very strange. The black ones are carved out of some volcanic rock and seem to shift between normal pieces and twisted tentacled monsters. The white pieces carved from alabaster depict humans armed with all manner of weapons. You could swear that you see a knight that resembles yourself. Suddenly, in the chair across the chessboard, a grim specter of death appears. Your eyes wind disbelief as the apparition beckons you to sit and play. You must fight to keep your sanity. That's a lot of cards. That's a lot of low, low cards, though. Your mind is weak. The confrontation with this apparition of death sends your mind reeling. You struggle to maintain your sanity. We are not ready for this. This is one of the more dangerous encounters we can have. Thankfully, it's not one that will punish us very much for just walking away. The specter startles you. You wonder if this is some type of trick or illusion. Could this be real? You can sense the currents of sorcery at work here, but just what the source is, you cannot be certain. It beckons you to sit across from it. The apparition motions to the board again, suggesting that you begin the game. So, that's not a good chance of us winning. So we're going to leave it alone. So, let's let's cover some encounters. Some encounters... Well, okay. There are various cards you can get for, as rewards or as failures, and they depend upon the encounter that you have. Most of the time, you'll get some, like, some experience points from most encounters will give you that. Sometimes bullets or uh, health or sanity. Some of them can give you some powerful... Like, you might get a spell or some sort of special uh, feat. You might get um, a special item or something of the sort. But the penalties can also be severe. I believe death has a 20% chance that it would have generated a death card on your failure cards. What that means is that if you draw that card, you die. Instantly killed, no matter what you had. If you had 40 life, doesn't matter, you're dead. Your character had a bunch of stat points and so on, but you drew that death card. Thanks for playing. You're dead. This is one such encounter that can do that to you. We will leave him there at the moment. A vase in a vase. You noticed the eerie glow at first. There was a large vase set on a pedestal. The opaque glass base is topped with a ceramic lid that is marked with strange runes and glyphs. As you observe the vase, a face materializes within it. It swirls around inside, locked in a horrific, silent scream. The face in the vase is truly disturbing. You can't actually hear it scream, but the expression evokes an overwhelming urge in you to scream as well. Your mind is weak. You find yourself screaming at the top of your voice before you even realize it. The face swirls around in the interior of the vase, illuminated from within by a ghastly blue energy. The silent scream still echoes in your ears, or perhaps only your imagination. You recognize the vase's construction and the runes etched along its lid. It's a spirit jar. Its sole purpose is to bottle up and slowly leach energy from, the powerful, from powerful beings. You should proceed with caution. This is the second part of a quest, and we will leave it alone at the moment. A pair of scything blades. Suddenly you look up and see two scything blades racing down the hallway at you. They are razor sharp and suspect they might be able to cut you in half. Traps in this game are particularly bad. You do not want to fail a trap check if you can possibly avoid it. They have an excellent chance to wound you. You do not want a wound. Well, we can duck under the blades. You don't see anything coming at you in a stagger at a lower level. You decide the smart move is under the blades. We better get cups up there, or this is bad for us. 
Well, that's not the cups card we wanted to see. And I can't use duck and roll because, well, duck and roll doesn't matter. There's no cards up here that I need to lower. Your reflexes are getting slow. You hope you come out of this alive. I selected the card that had our talisman on it, so we will not take this one point of damage. And we did not lose the talisman either. You hear the soft beat of a human heart. It seems to slowly grow louder. The air around you becomes cold and you start to see your own breath. Suddenly, a ghost materializes directly in front of you. It is the ghost of a woman dressed in an elaborate bridal dress. The sight of her is quite a shock. The sudden appearance of the ghostly bride threatens to send you into a panic and damage your sanity. Your mind is weak and your courage fails you. Weddings have always made you nervous and this isn't helping. A ghostly bride hovers in front of you. You are alarmed to notice that she seems to transform herself across a range of apparitions. At times she has a vision of calm, innocent beauty, and then her eye sockets seem to empty and she appears fully skeletal, a harbinger of wrath. You sense some traumatic event has bound her here, and she seems to be longing for the return of something. Let's try communicating with her. You decide to use your talents, your psychic talents as a medium to find out why the ghostly bride is waiting here. You went through a trance and soon are talking with the ghostly bride. She explains that she is waiting here for her betrothed who is late for their wedding. She wants your help. Her name appears to have been Constance, and she is waiting for her betrothed to appear and marry her. You get the feeling that she's been waiting a long time. She wants you to find him, but has no idea where he has been hanging out. She is certain, though, that he is somewhere nearby. There's a good chance we might encounter a succubus in this room. Or a chandelier dropping on our head. A writhing mass of insects. You notice that the floor in front of you seems to be moving. You step closer thinking that it must be some sort of optical illusion. Suddenly you step on something and it makes a squishing noise. You look down and see a writhing carpet of insects covering the floor. Scattered about the insects are the bones of their victims. You've never seen so many insects together all at once. Waves seem to undulate across an ocean of insects. The patterns are almost mesmerizing. You get a very bad feeling looking at this. It makes you afraid. mind is weak. You struggle to maintain your sanity. You feel like the creepy crawlies are all over you and you start to jump around and try to sweep the imaginary creatures off. You feel ashamed when you finally come down and realize what you are doing. You count dozens of different species and you wonder why they would all be gathered here together. The bones indicate a food source of some sort, but you wouldn't expect so many different types. Centipedes, cockroaches, ants, and spiders? If you want to keep moving down the corridor, you're going to have to step on or over them. So it's tougher to step across them than it is to step back. I think, though, we will make an attempt to do so. You shuffle here and there, careful not to disturb the giant colony. A few try to crawl up your legs to bite you, but they're easily brushed away. Butler's ghost. A tall, well-dressed figure looms at the view, holding a silver platter in one hand as if to offer you an appetizer. Your eyes travel down to the platter and behold half a human head. You feel a surge of panic growing within you. You've been trained to expect and deal with things like this. Even so, no matter how many times you see something like it, it still requires steady nerves to keep calm. can't keep the growing feelings of horror at bay. This encounter is definitely heading in the heading in the wrong direction. Guess we couldn't face it. 
Standing in front of you is the figure of what was obviously once a butler or servant. You say once because you are sure that what now confronts you is a supernatural entity of some sort. It is the most corporeal ghost you have ever encountered. You have read of such things in Tobin's spirit guide, but you are certain that this is very unusual. You approach the butler, and his glowing eyes are fixed on you. The head of the plate suddenly stares up at you as well. May I help you, sir? It intones, and you are not sure if you actually heard its voice in your ears or just in your head. Let's go ahead and order dessert. Without displaying the slightest amount of unease, you inquire about dessert by telling the ghost, Yes, my good man. The guests in the dining room are getting a little excited about their dessert. Could you head over there to the kitchen and see what the problem is? I'm not dessert. The head on the platter gurgles out fairly well for not having a jawbone. The butler stares at you with a wry smile. Again. Well, we had a better hand last time. So this is a big part of the game, is failing over and over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> All right, there we go. We finally got a good hand, or a decent hand at least. We'll take it with this. Why not? Let's, let's win the challenge. You want to be strategic, because you definitely do want to win the challenges with as many points as possible. We've, we're unlucky so far. We haven't gotten any experience points yet. Hopefully that will, fix, that will be changed here. Oh dear sir, I'm afraid I haven't the time. I'm waiting here to bring the master his supper at the proper time. So you can follow your nose to the kitchen and talk to the chef yourself. No experience yet. The butler does not have the time to order dessert for the ghostly dinner banquet as he must wait for the master to serve him his supper. He says that you should go place the order with the chef in the kitchen and return here for directions. Another class one haunting. This one we don't actually have to pass a horror check for because we already encountered this. We'll try to get her again. You don't say that you don't you didn't stand a ghost of a chance. Get her? What were you thinking? Hope you guys don't find that sort of thing too cheesy. Um, I remember that for the encounters I added, I had to add all the text for all of it. And I tried to keep it in theme with the punny nature of this game. That's a good hand, kind of. Two aces, but three face cards. But when the challenge. You got her good. No one is going to believe how you did it, and you aren't sure you are either. Three experience points. The first experience points we've earned this game. Let's go ahead and spend it. Experience points are placed into these circles, and they give you what you see up here. I'm thinking that we want one more swords to start. There we go. We'll probably increase our cups next, and then go for another skill card. The other skill cards you get are similar to this card. They let you increase a stat, they give you some sort of secondary abilities, and often the last one will be a bone you can purchase. Your background will let you purchase up to two additional skill cards. So with that in mind, you should know that skill cards will generally focus on a single type of stat. Our background is cups based, and we were lucky enough to get plus one swords with this background as well. Or not lucky enough, that's what that's what come with this background. But this one's mostly cups. We'll probably be able to level cups like three or four times here. If we take a magic background, I'm sorry, a skill card, then that will be pentagrams, for example, or pentacles. A melee would be swords, for example. The gun case room. 
there's a decent chance you can pick up a gun in this room. But we'll want a higher ranking in our... In our skills first. I think it's a pentagram check? A uh, wands check? I'm sorry, it's, it's a wands, I think, in cups. So I may want to level up our cups once more before I search that room. You see a locked wooden door. There is a worn keyhole right where it belongs, but no sign of a key anywhere. Keys are interesting, these locked doors. There's a chance that you will get experience points and an aura of fortune for lockpicks. But, but, there's also a chance you can get ill omens from them. We'll attempt to pick the lock once. You examine the lock mechanism and decide that you just might know how to finesse it open. Well, we might just know how to do it. Technically, we could get an Ace of Swords up there. The lock opens. You are just as talented with the lock as you thought. The mechanism clicks, and you turn the knob to open the door. A pile of papers. You see a bunch of papers spread out on top of a desk. Among the clutter are an assortment of old envelopes, letters, and even a few parchment papers. Just like the pile of junk, you only have one chance to search this. I wouldn't mind waiting till we get a little more pentacles before we do so. They're also part of a quest. One of several quests, actually, involve papers in this game. You hear a mechanism click and see motion out of the corner of your eye. A large pendulum swings down onto your location at a tremendous rate of speed. It looks like it cut you in half. It doesn't really matter which of these we do, so we will do step aside and deflect the blade. It seems like a crazy idea, but your martial arts judo training kicks in. You decide to strike the blade and nudge it to the side as you step in the opposite direction. Well, we better have pentacles or we're, this is going to be bad for us. That's not the pentacles we wanted to see. Can't move quick enough, and you miss your deflection. Come on, game. What's, 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 what's happening here? Why are you doing this to us? A haunted painting of a duelist. Your attention is drawn to an old portrait hanging on the wall. It portrays a man dressed in early 19th century attire holding a dueling pistol. He seems eager to use it. A sudden chill shoots down your spine as you notice the figure in the portrait raise his pistol and point it at you. Your eyes wind disbelief as a figure of the portrait cocks a dueling pistol with a with a smile on his face. Maniacal? You wonder how a ghost pistol works. Your mind is weak. The confrontation with the ghost duelist threatens to paralyze you with fear. The ghostly duelist remains poised for a duel. You sense that is what he wants. Their first move over, however, seems to be yours. He's part of a quest, but very rarely will we be able to get this quest. Mostly because it's... You need, I think, four pentacles to take the quest. And I don't know if we'll get that many pentacles. And because it requires quite a bit of running around. So we'll just engage him in a psychic duel. The best way to send the spirit back to the spirit world might be to give it what it wants. Assuming you win, of course. You lost a duel. You watch a psychic hole opened up in your chest and it hurts. You don't need to get that looked at. We'll try it again. You didn't think I would win, did you? <laughs> Say, Terry's doing pretty poorly, all things considered. We failed, I think, more horror checks and more checks than we've won so far. Fail. 
meal. I want a better hand. There we go. A King of Cups and a Queen of Pentacles. Maybe we can finally win this challenge. Wow. We did, though. You finally won the duel. It was more like a shootout. Upholding the whole pretense of fighting a pistol duel, you summon a psychic weapon. Marshal off 10 bases, you turn and fire and spiritually wound the annoying thing, sending it on its way to the spirit world. An edge upgrade. So we can increase one of these once. I'm thinking we probably should make traps a little easier, so we'll upgrade our lightning reflexes once. The difficulty will be lowered by one. A disturbing tapestry. Your attention is drawn to an old tapestry hanging on the wall that depicts a medieval battle of some sort. It looks like it should be in a museum. Examining the battle scene a little closer, you immediately notice the large red hand that divides two groups of armored knights. Suddenly, the battle seems to come to life. Knights charge the hand on both sides and are knocked to the ground. You stare at it in amazement, wondering if you're hallucinating. Your eyes wind disbelief as the battle unfolds before you. A ghostly vapor seems to enshroud the tapestry. Your mind is weak. You can't seem to pass any tests in this accursed mansion. Cursed artifacts give you the creeps. Ghosts give you the creeps. <laughs> Piles of junk give you the creeps. Everything gives you the creeps. And you remember that night that you spent at the museum at the Mystatonic University. You still can't remember several days in that mission. Tapestry is obviously animated by some type of sorcery. It might even be possessed by some malign spirit. You should be seen with caution. It isn't unheard of for something like this to function as a doorway or a portal to another dimension. Once in, you might not be able to get back out. This is the second part of a quest, so we'll leave it here. A doorknob monster. You see a typical wooden door. However, when you go to turn the knob to open it, it transforms into a vicious mechanical mouth that sinks its teeth into your hand. The pain is agonizing, and you pull back your hand in an alarm, only to find that it hasn't been hurt at all. Well, these are not good chances for either of them, but if we want to do it, let's try at least once. Force yourself to grab the lock. You're pretty sure that this snapping doorknob is just an illusion. You were bit and felt a sharp pain, but there was not a single mark on your hand. You grab hold of the doorknob and it seems to swallow your entire hand into its metal mouth. Intense pain lances up your arm and you feel like your hand is being gnawed off. But you persist and eventually the pain fades and your vision clears. Your mind has overcome the horror of the protective illusion that was cast on the doorknob. Hey, nice, another experience point. We, could des we desperately need experience points. Ew, outside. Mm. It's always dangerous going out here. A smoldering corpse. Your attention is drawn to a burnt corpse sitting in a charred but yet still comfortable leather chair. The smell of burnt human flesh is overwhelming at first. You've encountered it before, and no matter how often you have experienced it, it always initiates a slight gag reflex. You take a closer look at the body to see if you can figure out what happened. That's when the hands unclench and the armrests and beckon you closer. Your eyes wind disbelief as the burnt corpse motions you closer. Come here, will you? It whispers in a long, drawn-out moan. Your mind is weak. It's the weakest it's ever been from any odd Asian because we can't pass a single horror check. The stately smell of burnt human flesh and the crispy, crispy, yes, right, animated corpse are too much for your fragile mind to bear and you feel your own grip on reality slipping away. We've been very lucky that we haven't died yet. Because we're failing these pretty often, and we're not getting any, we're not getting a whole lot of these, thankfully. The creature does not seem to be able to leave its chair, being partially melted into the back of it. You think you hear something. The burnt corpse talks in the slightest audible whisper. Its mouth barely moves. Don't smoke. This is the second part of a quest, so we're just gonna try to flee the corpse. 
we succeeded. Fleeing an encounter generally will never give you anything. I think it's like a maybe a point five percent chance you actually earn something from the encounter. Take a couple steps back as the smell begins to fade. You already feel a lot better. Soon you're away from it and feeling fine. Yeah, there's almost you will almost never get anything from a flea challenge. Your attention is drawn to an old suit of armor standing guard in the gloom. As you strain to make out its features, you realize something is terribly wrong. A sudden chill shoots down your spine and a sense of dread engulfs you. There is a dark sorcery involved in this, and it nibbles at your sanity. Your eyes widen as belief as the cursed armor turns to meet your gaze. You must fight to keep your sanity. Well, guess what? We're failing, everyone. Your mind is weak. The confrontation with the cursed suit of armor sends your mind reeling. You struggle to maintain your sanity. The whole suit of armor is animated by some evil sorceress artifice. Such a curse would require great power and forbidden knowledge. Its gaze is locked on you and you sense an intelligence of some sort. Let's try getting the quest from it. You sense a keen intelligence before you. An aura of sadness permeates this very being. Uh, sorry, permeates. You also sense desire. Perhaps we can figure out what, if anything, this cursed suit of armor wants. Nice. That's very acceptable. The intelligence speaks to you. The sadness and anguish are nearly overwhelming, but you understand that it wants you to break its curse. 500 years ago, a subotic witch stripped the knight's soul from his body, sealed it into the armor, and bound the key within a small glass bead. The bead was taken by a common thief who perished in this house 30 years ago. The haunted armor cannot use the key itself, but perhaps you can. Nice, that was very nice. Two experience points and three sanity. All right, we'll have to come back here when we find the bead. Plus one cups. Work toward that skill card next. Stats are very important to level. I find it to be the most important thing for you to try to level. And you want to kind of level them all equally if possible. We'll probably be going for some sort of pentacles card next. I'm not going outside quite yet. I at least want to search this room first. Your attention is drawn to an old iron bed that seems to have a large lump lying under some dirty old covers. You approach carefully and notice the shape of a body. A blanket is pulled up over the body's head. Curious as to what is underneath, you slowly pull back the cover. A grizzled corpse, perhaps a patient who passed away, lies in the bed. Suddenly, it turns its head towards you and hisses. Your eyes wind disbelief as the undead patient rises from its hospital bed. Your mind is weak. You struggle to maintain your sanity. Then the patient sits up and then turns and plants its feet on the floor. You are certain that it's upset about a lot more than its hospital bill. Let's speed it up. You know how to handle the undead. That's one of the first things they teach you at the Odd Academy. Destroy or disable what's left of the brain. You should be just fine. Really? <laughs> it's a lot of wands up there. It's a lot of wands. This thing is pretty tough for an old sick zombie. You better be careful you might catch... You, you, blah, blah, blah. you better be careful you might catch something. That is not a good hand. That's what we can hope for is that we reduce the damage we take. You knock the head clean off its shoulders and the withered body collapses to the floor. The doctor is in the house. Life. Oh, I lost one sanity, gained one life. I don't know if that was worth it. Another class one haunting, getting lots of these. 
Notice that it's tougher now to get her. This is because the game saw us go up to five cups and it's like, oh, you must obviously be having an easy time. Let's make this tougher. I hate this decision. I hate this decision, Vic. I hate it. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and try getting her. I generally don't like running from random encounters if, if possible. We need the experience as well. So we, we might as well just stay here and slug it out with the thing. And we won with flying colors too. That was very lucky. You got her good. No one's gonna believe how you did it. And you're not sure you are either. That was pretty amazing. Three experience points and three sanity. I don't trust going outside quite yet, so we're not going to do that. Well, the good news is we have a way to step around the insects in the future, too. Let's search the workshop. I'm surprised we haven't had a story token drawn yet. We haven't, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to cut the recording a turn or two after our first story token. You feel your footstep down on the pressure plate and then hear the pneumatic sounds of darts being shot through blow tubes. You catch a glimpse of the deadly swarm of needle-tip killers heading your way. Well, we have a good chance to do either of these thanks to that minus six modifier. Instinctively duck away. You react without thinking, tucking into an aer aerobic, I'm sorry, acrobatic duck and roll. Well, we'll still have to get lucky to win it. But we did. It's very important that you try to win all the trap challenges that show up. Now, we could try a duck and roll. to get a little more points from this one. If we succeed, roll one bone, then select X revealed non-face trick cards and bump their card values down minus X, where X is the number of cups rolled, then draw a card. Let's, uh, let's give it a try, shall we? Let's give it a go. How actually, how much, tr uh, it's two, well, let's do it. So first, we need to roll less than our cups stat. And we did. We can select two cards and bump their values down by two. We'll select this one and this one. And we didn't get a card that was useful, but we did get two more points. We tumble away from the curtain of darts and emerge unscathed. Besides, I thought that was very thematic to use duck and roll when we chose duck and roll for the, for the encounter. Four life is nice. Good, good job, Terry. The more life and sanity you possess, the more losses you'll take when you begin taking losses from failing encounters. Really? Nothing in the workshop today. The plant room will generally have a decaying plant. It'll have a Telesrati generator and maybe a man-eating plant will be in here. There might be a Telesrati or a brain bot in here too. We just got our first story token. Trained to deal with this sort of thing. You have extensive training in fighting vampires. You are familiar with both their strengths and weaknesses. All challenges that involve cups as the primary suit receive a minus one modifier to the number of trick points needed to win while the challenge is active and the story icon is active. Nice, so traps and fleeing will be much easier for us to do. You hear a rustling sound and pause to locate it, but it quickly stops. After waiting patiently, you start to move again, only to once more hear the strange rustling. It sounds like a bush being shaken for its berries. Without any warning, a six-foot plant creature leaps out at you, its tentacle-like vines and roots reaching out to entangle your feet. You can't believe what you are seeing. The plant is aggressive, and you are pretty sure it wants to eat you. Come on, Terry. Can we win a horror, ch horror challenge? Not today. Your mind is weak. You struggle to maintain your sanity. 
The creature is surprisingly mobile and agile. It's also intent on catching you. You can smell a sickly odor as in the air as it re releases a bunch of spores. That can't be good. You remember a case file that you read about? It was the 1915 Triffid event that began in Indochina and spread to Sumatra, uh, sorry, Sumatra and Malaysia. Agent John Windham and scores of other operatives were lost. It was supposed to have been contained and all the pods destroyed. Apparently not. We can try beating it up. It's not a bad chance, but I've had better. I think we'll make an attempt once. These creatures are very dangerous, but you are confident. You know how to destroy one of them. Three queens. That's promising. What? One more queen used. Nice. And we won. The thing just doesn't want to die, but you managed to inflict enough damage that it simply doesn't have a choice. Burning Knuckle. Probably the best thing Terry could have done. Plus two hit points. Darn it! Just plus two hit points for that. That sucks. Alright, everyone. We're gonna do this class one haunting, and then we'll call the session. Let's, uh, let's get her again. That's the whole plan. You didn't stand the ghost of a chance. Get her! What were you thinking? Ooh! Very rarely do we get a queen as a trick and have a king in our hand. You got her good. No one's gonna believe how you did it. And you're not sure you are either. Okay, everyone, we're going to stop here. When we come back, we will put these two experience points into a skill card and then keep on playing. And we will we might actually go outside as well. I generally avoid going outside into the gardens and the backyard and the garage because the quests out there are tougher, the traps out there are nasty, and it's a long way away from anything inside the, the building. But there are quests you can get out there. I'm not sure. But we'll think about it. Alright everyone, in any case I'm done. Thank you guys for watching. And I will see you all later. Take care everyone.